Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Messer and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. On the economic data front, mm-hmm. we got data today that showed U.S. labor costs jumped the most in a year as productivity gains slowed, adding risks to inflation, um, that it's going to remain elevated. It comes after the loud and clear message from Jay Powell yesterday that rates will indeed be higher for longer. What do things look like, though, on the ground for America's businesses? To help us answer that question, we've got back with us Sharon Miller, president of business banking over at Bank of America. The bank out with an update to its annual business owner report. It's a survey of 1,400 business owners, including businesses of $100,000 through up to $50 million in revenue. Uh, Sharon, welcome back. Taking a look at the report, I got to tell you, certainly there's some concerns here, inflation, geopolitics, but I got to tell you, it looks like overall things are going pretty well for these business owners. They're optimistic. They are. And uh, thanks for having me back. I appreciate the time today. And we did find that as we surveyed clients that their revenue expectations, at least for the next 12 months, you know, 65% of business owners told us that they expect their revenues to increase. So an overall optimistic tone coming from the small business community, I would say. Is this pretty much across all industries? I'm not quite sure how you dice and slice the data, um, Sharon, but is it kind of everybody? It is. I mean, it, it, we, we hear from our clients and certainly we talk to clients every single day. And what we're hearing, you know, there are some concerns, certainly, you know, the political environment we're operating in, inflation, I heard that as we were leading up to this segment. But all in all, business owners, and especially smaller business owners, they really have control over their business in spite of what's going on around them. And so they have confidence that whatever the you know economic environment is, they will overcome. And so that's what we heard in the survey results. And that's what we're hearing every single day across the desk. Well, that's interesting because, and listen, 65% of business owners expect their revenues to grow this year. 55% report they've made more money in 2023 than in 2022. Um, Good numbers, strong percentages, but did 70% of business owners last time the survey was done um, expect, you know, their revenues to grow this year? Give us, like, I'm always, I'm always curious, I know Tim is too, in terms of trend lines and how this difference is maybe from the last data set. So is it improving? Is it the same? It stayed steady. So it was steady from our last report 12 months ago. And so um, it's right in line. So we haven't seen a dramatic increase nor a a big decrease. And I will tell you what's interesting as the segment from 20 to 50 million, so the mid-sized businesses, they were 80% plus saying that their revenue was gonna increase over the next 12 months, which to me, that is something that is, is very good for the economy. Normally we see the inverse where the smaller businesses are more optimistic versus the mid-size. And this time we saw exactly the opposite. I mean, they're both very optimistic, but I would say the 20 to $50 million businesses in the mid-size category uh, were 80 plus percent told us that you know, I expect my revenue to increase over the next 12 months, and I expect to start accessing some capital, huh. which we haven't seen quite as much of in that segment. Okay, how are they going to access this capital? Because this is something we talk about all the time uh, when it comes to private credit, when it comes to rates. Um, what are you seeing as the source for capital for these businesses right now? Well, I mean, you have your traditional bank loans, lines of credit. Um, Certainly, we're seeing in the smaller segment where uh, business owners are accessing credit cards. And, you know, with that credit card, when we look at our data here at Bank of America, we see that it's on par with 2019. We have seen an increase in the uh, amount of credit card uh, balances. But what I would say is when you adjust that for inflation, we're right on par with 2019. So So I do feel... Go ahead. Well, I was just going to, anything concerning to you about that, about the, the mix of financing right now? No, I mean, I, I feel that, um, you know, we're in a very strong position with our clients. And certainly, um, you know, when we see that people are starting to access their lines of credit, they're feeling better. We've seen, you know, that that trend line be sort of stable where we weren't seeing as much coming through in the mid-size segment. And I do think that based on this survey and what we're hearing from clients, there's a tone of optimism out there that they're ready to get out there, they're ready to expand or you know take on an acquisition and um, and certainly some activity going on in the business in what, the business landscape. What what color can you give us in terms of default rates on either their business credit cards, personal credit cards, or anything that kind of ties back to? It sounds like 
you sound very optimistic um, on many levels. So I'm just curious, what are you seeing in terms of default rates or any signs of stress in t for some of those businesses? Yeah, I would say within within our portfolio, at least, I mean, we're very, uh, you know, we work with every client and we certainly are very strong on our client selection and, and making sure that it makes sense for the loan. And so we are at historically low levels on, um, you know, our credit losses. And so I do feel good about our portfolio and what's happening with the health of our business. Again, I, I kind of go back to this idea that, you know, the data in this are so good in this report. I was, I was, I was struck by that, but we do hear over and over again, surveys of, of folks and look, this is limited. You're talking to business owners here, um, about how, how well things are going, but we hear, we hear from folks out there, especially ahead of the election, that they are dissatisfied with parts of the economy. And I'm wondering if you can help explain, not politically or anything, but the disconnect between what you see in the survey and what you see in, in, in the other types of surveys when you know, voters are asked ahead of elections about how they're feeling. Right. And I think, you know, even in this survey, and I've, uh, I've been in president of, of small business for seven years, and we've been doing this survey before I even got here 10 years uh, in the making for this survey. So we've got a long track record of history and going through election cycles. And what we find is that you'll see a dip in the in the confidence because of, you know, what's happening in the political landscape and the, and the headlines. But what happens following that election is that there's certainty. And so there's, you know, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, doesn't really matter. There's certainty in what's going to happen going forward. And so you do see the economy start to move again. So, hmm. um, you know, it's it's a typical uh, cycle that we do see as we look back at our data. And, you, you know, it's 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 kind of a, a going through it again right now. We're in the election year. And so um, I'd also say that, you know, business owners, when we surveyed, are more optimistic about their own business and their revenue prospects versus the national or the local economy. And so I think that has a lot to do with, especially in the smaller businesses, they have control over their business in spite of what's going on around them. They can control their activity. They can control what they're doing. Right. Um, and they can pivot because they're small. Sharon, what's the diver uh, what's the demographics, the diversity of, of these statistics? I'm wondering if you can break it down because B of A did a survey, uh, I guess this was back in October, about 44% of black owners have had challenges accessing capital, according to a, a survey done by B of A last fall, with more than a third of those respondents saying they didn't have a relationship with a lender. Some 35% said they don't think they will ever have equal access to capital. And this is a story that Bloomberg has out uh, today about, you know, after the pandemic and there was so much uh, entrepreneurial spirit and businesses, including black owned businesses being created. And yet now here we are in 2023 and just 32% of black owners were fully approved for a loan or line of credit compared to 56% of white entrepreneurs. Uh, this was a March report from the 12 regional Fed banks. So I'm just curious, what color can you give us in terms of the diversity or the demographics of some of this data? Well, this business owner report was from all uh, different demographics and we do uh, release a survey on women-owned businesses, black-owned businesses, Hispanic-owned businesses. So we do have other reports that follow. Uh, this one was very broad in nature, and so we didn't dive into you know specific uh, races or uh, age demographics. This is across the board, and we do put out other surveys like that. And I'll tell you, uh, we find the same results in women-owned businesses and Hispanic-owned mm -hmm. businesses, and those are all the things that we are doing here at the bank to make sure that people understand how to access capital, how to have those conversations before you need capital so that you can prepare and get ready. So absolutely, those are uh, those are reports we put out and yep. those are concerns that we want to address every single day. Absolutely. Sharon Miller, president of business banking at Bank of America, joining us from San Antonio, Texas. Okay, this was news to me, Carol. Yes. Last year, GM decided it would ditch support for Apple's infotainment hub, Apple CarPlay, which, by the way, you can get Bloomberg Business Week Correct. on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, in its new EVs, so it could bolster GM's in-house platform. It's called Ultify. Perhaps not that surprising to those who followed consumer tech over the last decade or so. Doing something like that is easier said than done, as the rollout of the new software has been, well, flawed. Austin Carr and David Welch write about it in the forthcoming issue of Business Week magazine. You can read it now on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. Austin is Bloomberg News technology reporter. He joins us from our Boston bureau. I got to say, Austin, I had no idea that GM made this move until I read this story. And my first reaction was, 
why would the company do something like this? I mean, CarPlay is seamless. Uh, I think a lot of people would argue that it's really easy to use. And when it comes to consumer tech, I mean, I think it's fair to say that nobody really does it better than Apple. But then I started reading your story. It turns out that car companies give up a lot when they give up that dashboard space. Yeah, I mean, that's totally right. Uh, in addition to being totally seamless, Apple CarPlay is also super popular. And you can imagine the more popular it grows, the more data, the more controls that Apple wants access to, the more unlikely it is that they're going to use GM's uh, software, to use GM's infotainment apps, or to interact with their digital hub and, and how it controls the car or interacts with their EV batteries. And, and this became a sort of a major concern for General Motors in recent years, especially as Apple signaled that they want to expand with the next version of CarPlay into way more screens in the car to control everything from the speedometer to fuel uh, levels mm -hmm. to um, basically how you interact with the vehicle. And so GM basically decided last year that enough is enough. They wanted it not to be, they wanted it to be a GM car, not an iPhone that you're driving as one uh, GM executive put it to me. So wait, how deep was Apple already going in terms of its access to information about our cars? So right now, um, if you have CarPlay, if you get in a Ford or uh, sort of any uh, major automaker's car, it's a plug and play process. So they project it onto the screen. It's just sort of an overlay on top of the infotainment hub that you have in the vehicle already. So it's a version of the iPhone interface that you have that's modified for a car. But Apple announced in mid-2022 that it wants to branch out into a lot more features of the vehicle. And regardless of whether it's tapping into those data sources or just syncing with them, uh, it's essentially taking over the interface of the vehicle from not just the console center screen, but all the gauge clusters that you have behind the uh, the steering wheel. So th that's sort of what uh, you know these car companies like GM consider mission mission critical components, and they were getting really wary of how deep that Apple was uh, expressing its interest in, in reaching its tentacles into the car. And so that's why you see GM and Mercedes sort of drift away from this. Okay, so you say Carol says she gets it. At the same time, though, Austin, as you point out in your story, and look, you got to look at where the data is coming from. It turns out that at least according to Apple. Uh, people take very seriously whether or not the car has Apple CarPlay mm -hmm. when they're thinking about purchasing it. Yeah, according to Apple's research, about 79% of uh, US car buyers will only consider a car that's CarPlay compatible. Again, from uh, fact, Apple. According to Apple. From Apple, but they also say, according to Apple's research, it's also 98% of all new, new, new cars in the US come with CarPlay. So that's sort of an addiction. You, you cannot escape that habit forming just with you know the few cars that are not CarPlay compatible, which is Tesla and Rivian, and that's about it. Every other car that's on the road that's new is CarPlay compatible. And GM said, we're going to take that risk because we believe in our own software and we're going to in invest in our own native platform to try to get people to use GM software rather than Apple's. Well, I mean, how does GM internals, I mean, obviously we know what Mary Barra and team feel like, but I mean, um, do they all think that this is the right move that, you know, Apple can do things very well. Um, and as you write about Michael Waldron, <laughs> who got a new Chevy Blazer, but he wasn't so happy about not having CarPlay. Yeah, we, we talked to a bunch of uh, the, the first car that's being rolled out with this new embedded software platform that's a completely Apple CarPlay free is called the Chevy Blazer EV. And uh, it rolled out last year. We talked to a bunch of owners, including iPhone users who tried to adopt uh, adapt to this car. And they had a lot of trouble. In fact, the software and displays ran into so many glitches that a lot of these systems became bricks. They just blacked out altogether. They wouldn't work to turn on. Apps kept crashing, screens kept flickering to the point that GM actually had to issue a stop sale and, and a recall in late December to fix all these software. So, so far from a great rollout, not a very Apple-like sort of onboarding process. But then again, some of the customers that uh, we have talked to said once they got used to it and sort of got over that that habit and ripped the Band-Aid, they, they actually kind of like GM's software. And I, I can walk you through some of the yeah, features, but, please but there do. are upsides to those. Yeah, I mean, just as an example, so if you're uh, if you enter an address right now uh, on, on the Chevy Blazer, because it's integrated with the hardware components in the car, which is something that Apple CarPlay cannot do. So if I enter an address in this EV, it can automatically predict battery capacity along the way of that route and suggest uh, charging stations accordingly. So if I'm 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 plotting a, a you know a trip from from Boston to New York from where I am to you guys, 
uh, it can suggest charging stations along the way automatically, whereas Apple CarPlay would have no idea what the battery life of your car is. So that's just one example of the type of embedded native software um, integration can sort of benefit consumers who just are used to getting a projection interface from, from Apple right now and not realizing there are better options out there when it works. Austin, when it works, yes, that is great certainly stuff. key. This is a great story, Austin. Mm. I couldn't put it down once I started reading it. Austin Carr, Bloomberg News Technology reporter, joining us from our Boston bureau. Check out Austin Carr's story. He wrote it along with David Welch uh, in the forthcoming issue of Business Week magazine. It's on the Bloomberg terminal. It's at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. 